Welcome back everyone. It is time to look into the concept of instances that Singularity and Obtainer provide. As we have studied in previous chapters, when you execute a container from an image using commands as run, shell, etc., these containers are executed in the foreground, stopping any process once you exit. The behavior suits well for the use case of containers that execute interactive commands in a well-defined environment or in a batch processing. However, there are use cases in which you would like to keep the container running after you log out. For example, when you set up an application like a Jupyter Notebook and you are just waiting for connections from the browser. For this reason, Singularity provides the concept of instance. While Docker is a common choice of tool for setting services, Singularity has the advantage of working without requiring any special permissions. Like for example, when you are working in a cluster provided by your university or laboratory. In this chapter, we will take a look into the basics about the capabilities of an instance and some use cases. Let's look at the basics. To start an instance, Singularity provides the command instance. As an example, let's try to pull the CentOS image that was used in the previous chapters. We just have to do Singularity pull and the URL of the image that we are interested. In this particular example, Singularity is informing us that the image already exists in my computer, so there is no need to re-download. Now, if we want to run an instance, what we have to do is execute Singularity, followed by the command instance, start, we have to provide the name of the image that we would like to use, in this case, send OS 7. And we have to provide a name for the instance. Let's use my CentOS 7. And that's it. The instance started successfully. We can take a look at what are the instances running on in our system using the command singularity instance list and in this particular example we can look that my CentOS 7 it's being executed in the background. To interact with the instance the commands exec and shell are available and they work in the same way as when we use them to start a container interactively from an image. The instance must be referred as instance followed by the name. For example to open a shell inside the CentOS instance that we just started, we have to do singularity shell instance and the name of the instance that we provide. Now we can use interactively the container with the only difference that once we exit the shell, the process will not stop and will continue running in the background. Okay, let's exit the container, and as mentioned, if you try to look again, the process is still there. So, to actually stop an instance, we have the command instance stop provided by Singularity. Let's do Singularity instance stop and my image. All right. The instance is not running anymore. Those are the basics to interact with instances. One more important piece of information is you can start instances binding paths as we look in the previous chapter. For example, if we try to start the instance again using singularity, instance start, but this time, let's say we would like to bind CBMFS to be available inside the instance. We can do bind as we do when we interact with a container, providing the path, remembering that if we don't provide destination path, then it will be the same as in the host. Then the name of the image that we would like to use. And again, 
name for our instance. Let's try again. It can be a different name every time that you start the instance, but let's use the same one. Let's confirm the instance is there. And let's open again a shell just to confirm that the byte is there. CBMFS has been mounted as we requested using the option bind and the files contained in the host inside CBMFS must be also available inside the instance. Just to clarify, files were not shown the first time that we did the ELS inside CBMFS just because of the way that CBMFS works. It is a caching system that we need to specify explicitly that we would like to look into the files that are inside a directory to catch from the central server and pull the files. Let's take a look at the second example, a web server as an instance. As mentioned at the beginning, one of the main purposes of Singularity Instance is deploying services with customized environments. So we can take a look at this basic example, which is a web service showing HTML with a message. For this, we need to have a basic HTML file that we can name as index.html. Use your favorite editor. And let's copy the HTML inside the index.html. You can do it with nano, emacs, but it really matters is having the file available. So this is right now here in my current directory. If you are not familiar with HTML, you can take a look at this tutorial that uh, we are providing here, but it is not mandatory. What it really matters is just having the HTML. Now, Python provides a module called http.server to set up a simple local HTTP server. It must not be used for production, but for this example, works perfectly fine. To prepare this basic web server, we will create a definition file that we will save as basic server.dev containing the code that we are showing here in the page. So let's open this basic server.dev and just for the speed up things, let's copy and paste. However, let's take a look carefully at what this piece of code is doing. So, if you remember the chapter about definition files, this will take the Ubuntu image from Docker. In this case, is the version 20.04. Then it will perform some operations inside the image, such as update the packages and installing Python 3.9. Files is an option that will help us to copy the files from the host into the container. This is one more option to do uh, sharing of files. And in this case, we would like to put it inside TMP directory. And finally, this start script is an option that is executed when an instance starts. This is explicitly for instances. So the instance, what we'll do once it starts is it will go to TMP and we'll execute Python with this module HTTP server using the port 8850. Notice that if the port 8850 is busy, you can use any other one. All right, let's save this file. Okay, now let's build the image from the definition. For building the image, we need to have super user permissions or use this fake root flag in the following way. Singularity build. In this particular case, I don't have super user permissions, so we will just fake root 
then we have to provide the name of the image that we would like to create. In this case, let's use basic server with extension for the image. And we must provide the definition file. It's the one that we just created a moment ago. And we will have to wait a bit. It will perform the update as we specify in the post. And our image is ready to be used here. Now, from this image, we will start a new instance. Let's use Singularity instance start. One important step here is we ask it for copying the file index.html inside TMP. But remember, TMP by default is shared between the host and the container. In this very specific case, since we would like to use files inside TMP of the container and not of the host, we can use the option no mount TMP, which basically says, please not share TMP between the host and the container. We would like to use our own TMP inside the container. Then let's provide the image that we would like to use. And let's put a name for the instance. We will use my web service. This is started the instance and we will confirm that the instance is running there. And it's just available there. It also shows what is the image that we are using. Now we can confirm in the terminal that the web service is up using curl as curl http localhost and the port that we specify in the definition file. Let me scroll back just to remind you it's 8850. And this what it's doing is just delivering the HTML file that we saw that we set up in, uh, in the previous step. If you are using Singularity locally, you can try to open this URL into your browser. However, in my case, I'm not using Singularity locally, but I am using a remote connection. For opening pages that you are setting in a remote service, you need to do port forwarding. If you are not familiar with port forwarding, we provide here the basic syntax that must be used to perform a connection between your remote server and your local computer using a specific port. Let's try to do that. I will just open a new terminal and I will show you. In this case, I have to do ssh-l and I must specify what is the port that I want to use. In this case, it will be 8050, the port that I specify in the definition file and the web server is using for delivering the web page. We will port this to localhost using 8850. And I need to specify my username and the server that I am connecting. With the port forwarding set, let's try again to open the page in localhost with the port 8850. And that's it. You can see the web page that is being served by the web server set on the remote service. Let's confirm that. If I just stop the instance, and I try to reload this, the connection will be rejected because the web service is not running anymore. Notice that we never had to open a shell to communicate with the server. The process is running in the background and it will continue running in the background until we stop the instance. 
Let's take a look now to a more useful example. We will serve a Jupyter Notebook with a customized environment. So this will be just a demonstration of the capabilities of instances and services. So what if we provide a Jupyter Notebook ready to use root? If you remember the example that we built during the definitions file chapter, it will be just necessary to extend the definition file to include the installation of the notebook and the execution when the instance starts. In the page, we show already how it looks the definition file. So we will start from Ubuntu 20.04 from Docker. And in the post installation, the additional steps with respect to the example done in the definition file chapter is the installation of Python 3, pip, which is a Python package manager, and using pip to install the Jupyter Notebook. And that's it. The rest is what we did to install root inside the image and the setting of the environment variables. And finally, we must define that when the instance starts, the Jupyter Notebook must be executed using a port of our choice. In this case, again, 8850. Let's save this file as Jupyter root.dev. And just to speed up things, let's copy paste. It's clear now what the definition file will do. So we close our editor and we will build the images from the definition using singularity build fake root again, the definition file. And before we must specify what is the name of the image that we will get at the end. Let's call it then root. And we will have to wait until the image is built from the definition. Of course, you can start with an image, for example, that already contains Python or Jupyter Notebook. But in this case, we are just using the same Ubuntu as in the definition file chapter to illustrate the capabilities. And once everything is installed inside the image, we can start a new instance. Let's do this with singularity. Instance start. The image that we just built and a name. In this case, let's use my notebook. We can confirm that the instance is running with singularity instance list. And you will see information, including what is the image that has been used to start in the instance. Now, once again, to open the web portal, we need to make SSH tunneling. Since I am not executing Singularity locally, I will open a new terminal and I will have to do SSH-L, the port that we decided to use, that in this case is ADA50. And I will do the port forward. With the port forwarding in place, let's try to open localhost with the port that we specify. And you will notice that by, for security, Jupyter will ask a password or token that is unknown for us at this moment. Fortunately, we can execute commands inside the instance that is running. The way to do this is using singularity exec the reference to the instance that we, in which we would like to execute in this case is my notebook and according to the web page we must execute Jupyter notebook list so let's do that this is basically executing this command inside the instance that is already running And this will provide the token that we need to access the service. So we can simply copy this URL and try again. 
you will see that the notebook is up and it's actually being executed in the directory in which these files are located. Let's confirm that the environment is set properly. Opening a new notebook. In this case, I will open with Python 3 kernel. And let's try import root. This must confirm that root is available for execution in the notebook. This warning is just related to the encoding, and we should not worry right now about that. Now, we can execute the rest of the suggested in the lesson. In this case, it's just creating a new histogram that will be filled with a Gaussian distribution using a random generator, and we'll try to plot the distribution in a new canvas. So if we execute this, we can confirm that root is actually available in the Jupyter notebook that we just deployed. The very, very important part here is that with any Jupyter notebook that you write, you can provide singularity image that will set the environment that is required to execute the cells. So it means that it doesn't matter that if you or someone else comes in one, five, ten years, your code will work independently of what is the software available at that moment, as far as Singularity or Obtainer is available, and as far as the image that you have provided is available. This is extremely useful for reproducibility of results. Finally, as an exercise, try to set up a Jupyter Notebook, but this time with Uproot available. The hint is that Uproot can also be installed using pip. So try it before looking at the solution.